Hello everyone, the day is Thursday, January 3rd, 2019. This is the week in charts. Obviously, I want to thank everybody for coming today. I appreciate you taking time out of your busy schedule. I guess one of my goals for 2019 is to get the shows announced in a better fashion. All right, what are we talk about? Well, current market conditions, obviously. And once again, I think we're to a point now where you're going to have to say hello to my little friend. Your questions on trading. If you don't mind, keep them somewhat related to the slides because otherwise my ADD might kick in. And as we get to the live charts or when the live towards the end of the slides, when I open up for uh, questions of individual stocks, feel free to ask general questions then. And your favorite stock picks. And again, hold off until I open up to, to the live charts. And also, if you don't mind, and this is for your benefit actually, ask about one stock ticker at a time and then hit return. You can ask about as many as you want, but if you want to make sure I covered them all, in fairness to everyone else, make sure you just put one in each line. It also makes it easy for me to figure out which ones I covered and which I had to. All right, so the main focus this week is going to be the 19 trading resolutions for 2019. There's a disclaimer screen. As you know, you can lose money trading or as often sum it up. All predictions are about the future, and a lot of stuff can happen between now and then. So let's talk about 19 trading resolutions for 2019 and beyond. I put that and beyond in there just in case I get hit by a beer truck. And also because I've been doing this for a few years. And each year I find it fairly easy to add another one. In fact, some of the ones that I added this year, I could probably split off into various sects, I suppose. Uh, S-E-C-T-S, not S-E-X and go and elaborate from there and you'll probably see some of that so i think these are, are very timely in nature and i feel pretty good about them and i'm going to force myself to follow them as much as possible and i've also i've already had some somewhat success in not trading from some of these resolutions and we'll talk about that as we get a little further in all right number one i will only take trades when conditions are conducive to my methodology now for a trend follower that means that the market is going up if you're going to be buying the market is going down if you're going to be selling or shorting the market and if the market is going sideways then only take trades that you f truly feel can trade somehow in spite of lackluster conditions. Let me repeat that. If the market has been traded sideways for months, then I would only take trades that I truly feel can somehow excel in spite of lackluster conditions. One thing I was thinking about right before I started is that if you are new to trading or newer to trading, then there's nothing for you to do, okay? Unless you think you really have the mother of all setups, but if you're new to trading, you probably don't now would be a good time to learn how to just sit on your hands and pay attention to what's happening. I would probably encourage you not to short. That is, if you're new to trading, just because shorts, as I often say, can be a real pain in the buttocks and takes a little bit more experience and it's going to take a little bit more discretion to stick with them. So right now, if you are coming in as a trend follower and you want to follow along, then there's really nothing for you to do. Now, I wanted to show this trade just because if you do think there's something that could trade contra to the overall market or not be held hostage by the indices and you really like the setup, then by all means, take it. And this is one I took a while back and I'm still long this, full disclosure. And we had a nice little bow tie coming off of major, major lows, possibly all time lows. It's an energy sort of related kind of company. So I kind of felt like it might be able to trade ho uh, trade hostage, not be held hostage by the overall market. Also, it's foreign and slightly volatile. And I like the way that it made this longer term sort of cup and handle bow tie type of pattern. And 
it triggered a buy and then it came down it did nick the stop now i hate to show this particular example but i have several clients that were able to stay with it through a little bit of discretion now there's always a chance i'm going to pour salt in somebody's wounds by doing this but longer term i think if i can get you guys to understand how discretion works and graduate you up eventually what i want to do is create a mastermind kind of group to where we're looking at the same stocks we're sharing some ideas and we are all kind of reaching that next level together in our trading and that's why i preach so much about the importance of using discretion and not to go too far off on a tangent but as mentioned recently in the q a under the members section charlie kirk and i were recently talking right before we went to the retreat to his retreat we were talking about how it's been a little bit more difficult in more recent years and I was agreeing with him and I talked about how nearly all of my recent recommendations, even though quite a few of them work, they did require a tremendous amount of discretion. In some cases, just a little discretion, but it did require discretion on nearly everything I've recommended recently. So again, make sure you think you have the mother of all set up, something that can trade in lieu of what's going on in the overall market. Number two, I will carefully plan all trades ahead of time and then work diligently to follow that plan. Plan thy trade and trade thy plan. I know it's cliche, but how many of you actually do it? Okay. So again, here comes some more dead horse beating. Trading done properly can often be quite boring. My plan today was, unless we had a big fat opening gap reversal higher, I was not going to short this market. And I'm gonna show you a few things in a minute which, which sort of helped me stop, which did help me, I should say, to stop from shorting this market. But that's kind of boring. And I feel a little bit of performance anxiety. I did, I had a really good day yesterday. I hate to focus too much on day-to-day -day trading. But I wasn't banging out any new profit targets or anything like that. So I didn't feel that great about it. And then today, giving up all of those gains, or at least some of those gains. And I'm thinking, boy, there's got to be a way for me to just jump back in and maybe trade some of these leverage index shares or something for a little day trade or something. I'm like, no, I'm not going to do it. Well, that's kind of boring, but that's good. And a lot of things that I felt myself tempted to do just this morning and I didn't do have would have already reversed on me so if you are looking at that screen and as i often preach don't be as close to the market as you need to be but no closer you might want to write that down but if you are watching that screen and you begin feeling a little excitement or angst then you might be doing it wrong as i discussed in the I think it was January 2nd Q&A. Yeah, it was just yesterday's Q&A, January 2nd. I discussed a lot about talking about the trading for action and trying to avoid the taking mediocre setups and that you just sometimes just have to let things go and you can't kiss all the women. And a lot of times you get you might get all excited about a market but as I said again yesterday, when you back the chart out a little bit, it's like, well, wait a minute, that was just like an inside day. You didn't miss the mother of all moves. And trust me, there will be more moves down the road. For instance, today, you know, and I wish, but if we'd had a huge gap open, let's say a future's up 50 points, 60 points, whatever, pre-market, then I'd be a little suspect of that move higher, especially since the market is set up as a pullback I would say, you know what? I think that might be worth shorting. I think that might be an opportunity that's outside of my plan because I won't know if that's going to set up until the market actually opens. But 98.9% .9 of everything else I do, I know what I'm going to do. And I find myself, when I'm following the plans, it does become downright boring. Mark Douglas talks a lot about this. If you're feeling some sort of anxiety, then his point was that you're probably you're probably doing something wrong. Now, if you're new to trading a little bit a little bit harder to wrap your head around those emotions and feelings, 
But if you've been at this for a while, and I know, I know myself, when I find myself getting excited and dropping those F bombs and doing those all those things that are preach against, I realize that I have I'm doing something wrong. And Douglas went on to say that you have not fully accepted the risk. And that's another, that's probably a lesson in and of itself when you're making that plan to fully accept the risk of that trade. Now, we're going to get to seeking excitement in resolution number 11 in just a few minutes. Now, as I often preach, Montier pointed out that stress is created when information is changing or unknown. Well, when is information changing or unknown? As soon as the market opens. Well, when is information static? As soon as the market closes. So I do my analysis after the market closes. I try not to do anything on the fly and usually don't. I usually have a pretty good idea what exactly I'm going to do the next day. The reason I say a pretty good idea is we have to see what happens on the open sometimes, but there's a plan in place for that too. Look, for instance, if a gap's strongly against me and I'm in that oh crap mode, then I decide, okay, am I going to stick with that position or am I going to look to get out? Or do I have to look to get out? You know, where's my uncle point? I've already taken a loss overnight. How do I deal with that situation? So there's a few things that you cannot plan for, but you can know what you're going to do if they're going to happen. Now, here's more dead horse beating. The more decisions you make, the more stress, because with each decision comes what? Emotions and stress. And that's Damasio and Shaw, as I often say. And the example I often use is, okay, Dave, I didn't take that trade that you recommended yesterday. Now, what should I do? Should I get in even though the price is higher? Or let's say that the price is lower. Should I get in even though the price is lower? Or should I not do anything? Now you're faced with three different decisions. Let's say you don't do anything and the stock takes off without you. That's going to create some emotions. Let's say you get in even though the price is lower and it keeps on dropping. Then you're going to think, well, why did I get into stock and it kept on dropping? Okay. What if you get in even though the price is higher? Well, maybe that's going to be the high tick and then you might resent that. So if you didn't follow the original plan, you're going to create more and more stress for yourself. Information is always changing after our reports, Trump tweets, et cetera. Well, Michael, we're, you're getting ahead of me, but I'm going to tell you in one second, don't worry about the news. We're only worried about price, okay? But that's a good point, and, and point taken. Now, again, when you're making those unnecessary decisions, it's going to begin to grow on a geometric level. So then you end up with more and more and more and more and more and more decisions and more and more stress. And you create a lot of angst for yourself and a lot of anxiety. So you must reduce the amount of decisions you make by simply following their original plan. A minor tweak here and there with discretion or a damage control plan, okay? You know, use the word plan with a damage control because you will have a general idea how you're going to deal with it. Yes, you will have to occasionally do something like that sort of on the fly. But even then, for instance, if a market closes really poorly, then you could say, well, if my stop is pretty close, let's draw that in real quick. If my stop is pretty close, oopsies, then I know there's a pretty good chance that I might get hit on that open. So let's say, let's say you're in a stock and it begins to drop and the close is like right here and then your stop is like right there. Well, you know on today's open, or the next open, I should say, you know it's probably going to either gap below that or at least an early trade dip below that, but you don't know what's going to happen afterwards. So you have to have a discipline, the discipline enough to follow a general plan saying, okay, well, I'm going to have an uncle point in mine, and if it reverses before that uncle point, I'm going to stick with it. If it hits the uncle point, then I get out. And that little bit of added discretion over the long run, not every time, but over the long run, is going to help you to make more and more money. And it's also going to help you catch more and more winners. So when you don't follow the original plan, it creates a lot of problems and a lot of 
anxiety. All right, number three, I will only take trades that trigger an entry. How many times have I told this story? Payday. I'm down 30% or 50% in that turd you recommended. And I'm like, I never recommended that. And they're like, yes, you did. It's like, no, why would I recommend a stock that's going down? And they're like, you did. And I'm like, when? And they're like, six months ago. I'm like, ah, well, yeah, I did. But, you know, it was a beautiful little TKO like I show here or something like that. Just fantastic looking setup. But it never, ever triggered. It amazes me that so many stocks won't trigger or how many stocks, I should say, don't trigger and you don't end up putting capital into harm's way. As Druckenmiller once said, the way to build long-term returns is through preservation of capital and home runs. By not taking trades that don't trigger, according to your trading plan, you're going to help to preserve that capital. You're not going to put the capital into harm's way. Now, I got a little deeper into this in the psychology section, some of which I think is under members and some of which is under Trading Full Circle, which are both, the Trading Full Circle is eventually free with members and then the members area is gonna be free, the psychology there is free as long as you're a member. But anyway, as I went on to say, the problem with taking that trade, even though it didn't trigger, is that you're, you're setting a pattern of bad behavior and if you're breaking the plan, as I'm going to say in a minute, you know, you can't get a little bit pregnant. But if you're breaking the plan by not following it, by entering, even though it doesn't trigger, then who's to say, or I should say, you're not going to be likely to follow that plan and allow yourself to get stopped out and actually honor that stop should the market go against you. So you could end up with some really, really bad behavior. So again, make sure that trade actually triggers before you look to take it. No trigger, no trade. You just simply move on and say, next. I I can't tell you how many times I've had a great looking setup and it never did trigger. And yeah, it bums me out because I'm like, man, I work so hard and great setups are so few and far between. I finally find something great like this one here and then it just begins to implode. It's like, so what? No capital was put into harm's way. Now, I will pick the best and leave the rest. <laughs> As I often say, when somebody says, what's your holding period, Dave? I'm like, 10 years, hopefully much longer. I want to be in stocks as long as possible. That UGP triggered back in October. Where are we now? November, December. You know, I'm almost three months into that trade. I hope to be three years into that trade. God willing, we're all still here in three years. Somebody asked me, hey, Dave, remind, remind, remind me, hey, Dave, we still in that UGP? Well, it's probably a good chance that if I am, I'm going to show you anyway. Now, you're like, Dave, why you beat the dead horse on this? Why you keep saying don't pick stocks that look like electric cordigrades? Well, if you've come to these shows, and I'm not picking on the newbies who don't know any better. I'm talking about people who should know better. A few weeks ago, what happened? Hey, Dave, what about Home Depot? In my best Nicholas Fine voice, I say, no. So you people, not all of you people, but some of you people forced me to keep beating that dead horse. I think you I think you enjoy me doing that. <laughs> or what's the joke about the guy with the bear in the woods? He's like, uh, I don't believe you're out here for the hunting, are you? <laughs> anyway, number five, I will be patient. This is a reoccurring theme. Whenever I wake up in the middle of the night and have that monkey mind thing going on, I keep thinking how important patience is in trading. And it's hard, especially we all have these quote feeds on our desk and we surround ourselves with these monitors and flashing lights and everything. And who was it? Sakota once said, having a quote machine on your desk is like having a slot machine. You're going to want to feed it. And that is very much true. So patience is really, really tough. The waiting is the hardest part. So I'm sitting here wanting to make money today. I really want to make money. Obviously, if if we're not here to make money, why are we here? Okay. But I'm sitting on my hands because the market did not do what I wanted it to do to give me a setup, at least in the index or something like drip. 
So I'm forcing myself to sit on my hands and it's not easy. If you are a person of action, if you're type A like I am, if you're a person of action who, especially if you're successful and have achieved a lot of success in your life, it's gonna be really, really hard to be patient and not want to take action. It goes completely against our psychological makeup as motivated people. Now, yes, continue to do your homework in spite of the conditions, but make darn sure you have the mother of all setups when you don't have a tailwind. And that tailwind is what got me thinking this morning, if you are a newbie, there is no tailwind, or at least no upside tailwind right now, so don't buy anything. Okay. Now, the other thing is you're going to have to keep doing your homework. As I often say, if I ever solve for that outlier problem with trend following, and it's not just my version of trend following, it's trend following in general. And the outlier problem is that one occasional trade that makes you year. Okay. I have on a couple of leftover longs, UGP being one of them. And I hate to use the word hope, but hopefully one of those will take off. Maybe it will be UGP. And that's going to be the trade that helps me to mitigate the losses that I've had or the gains I've given up on some of the existing longs as the market had rolled over. Okay. And those occasional outliers can make a big difference. And occasionally you'll have an outlier on the short side when you're shorting too. So if I could ever solve for that, as I often see, say, you'd never see my fat horse again. But I'm working on it. And the way you work on that is you pick the best, leave the rest, and you still have to do your homework even if conditions are lackluster because you never know when you're going to find that one trade that might be able to trade contra to the market like the UGP, and ideally that needs to be a commodity-related setup or an IPO or something super speculative that you really think can trade Contra to the overall market, then you take it. As a story I've said ad nauseum, or told ad nauseum, I should say, had a client. He wasn't quitting the service, but he said, Dave, I'm just going to quit trading for a while, and I'm going to go away and do whatever. And he said, because I don't see any setups in the foreseeable future. And I said, you know what? I don't see any setups in the foreseeable future either. You know. And so two hours later, I found two of the biggest winners of the year. So that's the outlier problem. And I like to be frank with you guys and, and identify these problems that are out there. And maybe there is no solution for that other than work your butt off in your stock picking and do some serious homework. So that brings us to the next point. I will do my homework leaving no stone unturned. So what is that for me? And it's been kind of fun. I've helped a few of you guys recently set up Telechart. And if you need the link, I don't have the links in an easy-to-find place anymore on my website. But let me know, and I'll get it for you. But you guys who have I've recently helped are like, Dave, this is really cool. I kind of get it now. And looking at all those charts, I have a good feeling for what's going on. When we get to live charts, I'm going to flip through a couple of hundred when we do the market analysis part. And you'll get a pretty good feel, too. So having that quick and dirty analysis available to you is fantastic. Now, I do some slightly more complex things with Metastock. That's the other charting package that I use. But a lot of my bread and butter analysis is done through something quick and dirty like Telechart. So, again, that means going through a lot of stocks. Right now, my pullback scan, which is kind of crazy, it's very liberal. It's producing 3,000 stocks. Now, I'm not going through every one of them, but I'm probably going through the first 2,000 of those stocks. And then every day I look at 239 sectors, some ETFs, and some indices. And in going through all that process, especially because it's like a bottom-up type of process, by looking at all the stocks first, I get a pretty, feel for what's, pretty good feel for what's going on with the market. As I often say, if I see a lot of debacle du jour, a lot of stocks getting torpedoed, and then I see a lot of momentum stocks beginning to get hit, and my own portfolio a little bit gets hit a little bit on the momentum side in those stocks I've been in for a while, then I know maybe the market's beginning to turn. So you put together all these little pieces, 
And a lot of times, all these little things will begin to happen. Momentum will start getting whacked either in your portfolio and especially in a lot of these momentum names. You'll start having these bona fide, as I said a second ago, debacle de jours, meaning that stock gets torpedoed overnight. That could be the beginnings of something big happening. And by leaving no stone unturned, you're going to see that unfold. And six months later, you're going to be at a cocktail party and people are going to be like, what the hell is going on with the market? And well, that's what's it's like, wow, it's just rolled over. We saw it coming from a long ways away because we did our analysis every day. Number seven, I will only trade the charts and ignore all other extraneous information, tweets, and everything else. Now, this is another one of those Dave's beating a dead horse. But seriously, read my lips. I ignore all news and other extraneous information. Now, as soon as I say this, hey, Dave, earnings are coming out tomorrow. What do we do? Nothing. Hey, Dave, what about this Brexit thing? You know? No, don't do anything. Now, this does not say that markets, that news does not affect markets or have an effect on markets. It does. But a lot of times it's either muted or quite the opposite. Now, the reason it's quite the opposite is it's often baked in the cake. Number eight, I will place a protective stop after a trade triggers. Now, as I'm going live with this, I was thinking on this one, maybe for the more experienced trader, the more disciplined trader, maybe make that an alarm near where your stop will be. But be willing to honor that stop when it gets hit and you obviously should be exiting the market. I'm not talking about a discretionary situation. I'm talking about when you should, when you would be wrong. Beating the dead horse again, the reason you need to stop is no one knows exactly what a market will do. Not you, not me, and certainly not the guy who screams on TV. I guess one day I'm going to do a presentation and not say that. I guess today is not that one day. Number nine, I will take partial profits as offered. My only way to solve for the fact that I don't know which next trade will become my big outlier other than good stock selection going in. And of course, on every trade, I think it's going to work. And I think it's going to work longer term. As I often say, I took a personality test and doing a lot of this research for this ongoing trading psychology course I've been working on, on and off for three or four years. And I realized that maybe I do have a bit of a problem because I scored a zero in agreeableness. <laughs> so that means I expect everyone to agree with me. And I expect, of course, the market to agree with my analysis. Well, that's a big disadvantage coming in. But the enlightenment or the epiphany, if you want to call it that, every now and then I could use a four letter word, right? Four syllable word. That is. I use a four letter word occasionally in trading, too. But the point is that. That was a bit of an epiphany for me because now I know why I get so angry when the market doesn't agree with my analysis. And that's why I take partial profits if I'm partially right and I stop out if I'm flat out wrong and I allow myself to get stopped out if I only get the partial profits out of the trade, the initial profit target being hit. Go through the money management module for a lot more on that. The point is that. If you're able to take those small profits off because you can only really look out so far in the markets. I hate to even use the word predict, but you can only look out so far. And if you've got a pullback, you know there's a pretty good chance that market might bounce back into the direction of the major trend. But you don't know if it's going to keep going in that direction. As I often say, it's sort of akin to predicting the weather. Right now I'm looking outside. What's been raining like a cow piss on a flat rock lately but uh <laughs> you know it's kind of cloudy well it is actually raining but it's it's kind of cloudy and stormy looking i'm like well it's probably going to be raining soon and now that i'm looking at it carefully it looks like it's beginning to drizzle out so 
But I don't know if it's going to be raining this time next tomorrow or the next week or the week after. So same thing goes with markets. You can only look out so far. So if you do get that initial profit target out, I call that the better than a poke in the eye trade. You're not going to get rich on these trades that come up here, hit the profit target, come back out and come back down and stop you out. But it will help to keep you in the game. And it's better than a poke in the eye, as I often say. And the secret to this game is longevity. And stops, and especially initial profit targets combined with stops, will help to keep you in the game until you catch, and I hate to make it sound elusive, but they are. If they were a little less elusive, I probably would be, you probably never see my fat ass again, okay? I wouldn't have to fully solve for the problem. I just need a few more of those outliers. And that's why I work so hard every day in my analysis. And that's why I spend so much time talking about stock selection. And again, you have to, getting back to a few back, you have to pick the best and leave the rest. Number 10, I will not take any unnecessary action, thereby micromanaging myself out of trades. Now, micromanagement comes in three forms. One is mentally monetizing profits. And mentally monetizing profits will get you into a lot of trouble fast. And an example would be, and this is a leftover slide from a couple years back, but I got a little home here. So I'm guessing that when you're looking at that trade, let's say you've got a $3,000 mortgage and you just made $3,000 on a trade and you're thinking, well, you know what? I can cash out and pay $3,000 on that mortgage. Or if, if you have a car that's has, I don't know, $10,000 left, you make $10,000 on a trade, yeah, I'll just cash out and pay off that car. I've seen people do that all the time, and they feel pretty good for a little while, but if that stock keeps on running, you'll feel really, really bad. And once again, we circle back to that outlier problem. If you exit a trade, which could turn into an outlier, I should say exit a trade prematurely, then you're never going to catch that occasional outlier, and you're never going to do better than mediocre longer term. Yes, over the short term, you might knock it out the park. But remember, if if market goes up 25% and you get out, you're not going to catch a 50% move. And if it goes up 50% and you get out, you're not going to catch a 100% move, and so on and so forth. Now, the second form of micromanagement is when – a stock begins to go against you slightly, or if it begins to kind of die out and go sideways. But Dave, I thought you were a trend follower. I am a trend follower, but I look for that perfection going in, not afterwards. As I preach, obsess before you get into a trade, not afterwards. Once you're in a trade, it should be fairly boring. I know this morning I dropped an F-bomb on an open position, but as a general statement, you don't want to take any unnecessary action and micromanage yourself out of something. But Dave, how, how long is too long? What if it goes a month? I don't care. If you're not stopped out, stay with it. What about two months? If you're not stopped out, stay with it. And I've had stocks recommended into service go sideways for weeks, not do anything wrong, not stop out. They just start basing after we get in and then get bought out. Now, the other form of micromanagement is just a general trying to outsmart the market, thinking that, well, you know, this stock, I can remember one particular example on the short side. The market sold off fairly hard, and e a client emailed me and said, Dave, the stock's up a point today. The market's down hard. Something's wrong. I'm going to get out. It's like, okay, well, do what you want. And then the next day, if memory serves, the stock imploded, went down 30, 40, 50 percent. And I see that happen all the time. I should have I should have looked through my charts. I didn't think about it earlier. But there were some recent examples. I have one client in particular. He's a little bit better now. But he always emails me when a stock if there's a stock in the land your list of 20 or 30 percent. Usually I'll get an email that day saying, you know, I was just in that one particular stock, but I decided to get out because it wasn't moving. Number 11, I will seek excitement and entertainment outside of the market. As I preach, 
If you want excitement, go to Vegas or have an affair. That way, you only lose half of your money. Now, along the lines of excitement or entertainment, what I do is because I have this educational business, instead of going off and doing something fun, other than having an affair, obviously, I focus on my work. That members area took me a year and change to build, and I'm still working on it in some way, certainly still adding content every day. And that has kept me really busy. That has kept me from watching the screen. I found myself in more recent times when I don't feel like working on all this stuff, I find myself watching a screen. What does that do? That kind of begins to suck me in. It's a bit of a siren call. And by the way, if you have to, put some physical restraints in place, okay? I, it's, it's, it's kind of the same person. I'm using both examples. But this one person said two stories here, actually. One, he said, my trading has gotten a lot better. I'm like, well, what have you done? This is the guy I was just talking about who micromanages. He says, well, my, you know, what are you doing? You, you got discipline? Did you get a trading journal? What happened? No, I, one of my doctors quit. Now I got to cover her shift at the hospital. I'm literally working day and night until I can find someone. I don't have time to take mediocre trades. I don't have time to micromanage myself out of trades. And then he begins, he began, started catching, and here I'm going to use that stupid word again, but he began catching some of those elusive outliers and did really well. Now, I'm just thinking of this as I'm speaking, but the other story with him was he actually, because he was kind of sucked into that siren call of day trading and over trading and micromanaging, he actually put his majority of his funds or his trading funds with a broker that he actually has to call in, okay? That seems like a bit of a drastic measure, but it worked for him. I know he's probably paying a lot more commissions for something like that, or he might have an account where if it's big enough, you get unlimited trades, but he has to call those trades in, and he, and to quote him, he says, I don't want that secretary thinking that I'm a madman. So he has to think long and hard before making a trade. Number 12, I will accept what the market is willing to give. What's the saying? If you have children, you probably know this. You get what you get, and you don't throw a fit. The problem is we people, again, that are here today are motivated people. Otherwise, you wouldn't be here, okay? And we are people of action. And we became successful, how? Well, through a lot of control, controlling as much of the situation as possible. The serenity prayer comes to mind. God grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, the courage to change the things I can, and the wisdom to know the difference. What's the genius prayer that we talked about before from Pearls Before Swine? <laughs> Uh, I wish I could think of it off the top of my head. If anybody knows it, uh, type it in. Craig, if you're here, type it in. That's where I got it from originally. But the genius prayer basically says the wisdom to know I'm different, <laughs> etc. cetera. 13. This is a big one. This is a huge one. I can't, I can't emphasize how important this is. I will do an honest post-mortem on every trade. And again, this is Big Dave beating a dead horse. I don't know if I have me popping up anywhere again, but I should. But it's pretty amazing how important a post-mortem is. When you back that chart out with 1,000% clarity, sometimes, and it doesn't happen to me nearly as often as it used to, but... Sometimes you're going to find yourself thinking, what the hell was I thinking? Now, if you find yourself thinking that, that's good. That means that you're becoming better at what you do. If you would have only seen it with a little bit more clarity going in, you wouldn't have taken that trade. Now, we're going to talk a little bit about process-oriented versus outcome-oriented in just a minute or two here. So it's not saying that you won't have bad trades, you won't have losing trades. I probably do too good of a job tempering everybody's 
expectations. I'd probably make a long, lot more money if I stood in front of a rented jet or Lamborghini or whatever and, and tell you how much money I made before lunch. And, you know, just watch the weekend charts on YouTube and the guys that advertise on my channel. I guess I shouldn't pick on those guys because they, they pay me for advertisement. <laughs> they don't pay me directly. They pay YouTube. But anyway, you, you know the type. So you will have losing trades, obviously, but the way you have fewer losing trades and better trades is go back and do that post-mortem. Now, if you go back and do a post-mortem, and it, one way to think about this is imagine yourself doing a post-mortem ahead of time, okay? Do a little time travel here, okay? Imagine that you're... You're getting ready to get into a trade, or at least you're doing your analysis. You're thinking about getting a trade tomorrow. Imagine that if you were seeing that stock doing a postmortem and try to remove any emotions you might have attached to the potential of that trade. And if it still looks like the best trade in the world, then by all means, take it. Number 14, I will reward myself for following the proper process regardless of the outcome. If you truly did pick the best and leave the rest, and you did that post-mortem that I just beat the dead horse on, and you back that chart out, and you say, you know what? Everything here fit. The market was headed, headed higher. The sector was headed higher. The stock was headed higher. It's cleanly trading, or it trades cleanly, I should say. It's accelerating. It trades with persistency. It pulled back nicely. It pulled back deep enough, or the TKO was big enough to likely knock out some players. It triggered an entry. And I honored my stop. Then pat yourself on the back. Go have a nice meal. Take your wife out or your girlfriend. You probably don't want to take them both to the same place. But do something to reward yourself, regardless of the outcome. I knew I wasn't through with my little beating the dead horse, dude. <laughs> I would encourage you to read Annie Duke's Thinking in Bets. It's a pretty good book. It didn't really solve for how to separate the, the luck from the process type of thing, but it, it certainly pointed you in the right direction and got you thinking a lot about it. So I'll give her some credit on that. See books to read on my website. Now, the reason I popped up again, my little dead horse thing, now that I remember, is that the market could often be a bad teacher. And I know I've beaten the dead horse on this, and I'm going to keep beating the dead horse on this. I know that some of these trades that I've done off the hip in more recent times, even though they've, they've done okay, I probably shouldn't have done them. In 2019, I'm going to back off a little bit on that. I did get sucked into some of these trades because there was just nothing else to do, and I've, I've kind of violated some of those rules, and I'm going to touch upon that in just one second too. But again, the market could be a really – bad teacher. Now, Terrence O'Dean, he talks a lot about outcome biases. And he says that markets generate a lot of data, but they don't generate a lot of clear feedback. Outcomes are noisy. Good decisions may have bad outcomes. Bad decisions may have good outcomes. And we all have a tendency, and everybody's guilty, especially somebody like Big Dave, who scores a 0% on agreeableness in a personality test, but we all have a tendency to take credit for our successes while blaming our failures on bad luck or others. I'm beginning to listen to, and I'm probably going to go ahead and get the book. I think it's Extreme Ownership, and it's just kind of starting out and hasn't really got into it more deeply. But I think that's, I think that's very important, which kind of leads us to our next segment. But it's very important to take ownership for what you do. And you need to recognize when you're, you made a bad decision, even though the outcome turned out to be a good outcome. Now, number 15, very, very, very important. You have to hold yourself accountable. And as I often say, I know someone who's pretty good in their stock picking, and I tell you, when they're hot, they're hot. 
And sometimes I'm jealous. Sometimes they'll take setups from my Landry list. In fact, I do the analysis. He's a client, so he takes my setups and he takes my Landry list. And he takes the ball and he runs with it. And he prints money for a while. And I get a little jealous and he sings my praises. And I'm glad he's doing well. But I'm a little jealous. And then he begins to get a little careless. He stops following the rules. He starts entering a little early. He hangs on a little too long sometimes, meaning he lets that stop get hit and not on a discretion basis, but he just kind of hangs on and hangs on and hangs on. And it's kind of like a rinse and repeat type of cycle. And I asked him, and I know that you guys have been here for a while. You've heard it a thousand times, but we've got all the new guys coming in. And we got a lot of guys who don't listen. So <laughs> anyway, I said, look, would you be willing to get your wife involved? Would you be willing to say, look, this is, these are the trades I'm planning on taking. This is why I'm going to take them. This is where I'm going to enter. This is where I'm going to stop out. This is where I'm going to take partial profits. And this is how I'm going to trail a stop higher. And what he said kind of surprised me. He said, oh, no, that would end the marriage. So that told me right there that he wasn't willing to hold himself accountable. Now, what I do is I pretend that someone is looking over my shoulder. And as I'll say in a few minutes, if nobody is here, and usually nobody's here, but I'll actually announce my trades and explain what I'm doing and why I'm doing it. And if you're winging a trade, it's kind of hard to say, yeah, this is a wing and I'm winging a trade. And that introspection is really hard when you're holding yourself accountable like that. But I try to trade. Try to be the key word in this sentence. We're, none of us are perfect, right? But I try to trade like the whole world is watching. And in some cases, it's kind of easy if I recommend X, Y, Z, if I say, yeah, let's get in at 16, let's put a stop in at 12 or whatever, and take profits at 20, then I laid out a plan, so I have to follow that exact plan so I'm not a hypocrite. <laughs> Google Norm McDonald's uh, hypocrite uh, thing about uh, Bill Cosby. Pretty funny. Anyway, I don't want to digress too far. 16, I will embrace my emotions as I preach. I use the word embrace and not eliminate. Why? Well, here's that decision thing again, because every decision has emotions and stress. If you did not have an emotional part of your brain, you could never make a decision. As I've said quite often, those who have been injured or the unfortunate, uh, also the unfortunate thing of illness, they cannot make any decisions if that part of their brain has been damaged because one decision doesn't have a consequence over the other. Number 17, I will keep a journal of my actions and feelings. Now, one of the things that's really important, obviously, is you want to track your trades and everything. And, and that's important, but that's not what I'm talking about. Your broker can really do a good job doing that, especially nowadays, where you don't really have to worry as much. And what I'm talking about more importantly is your actual feelings. And this is my daily journal, and I'm going to do a better job in this this year. And this has already saved me a little bit. Now, I haven't made any money because I've been journaling, but it saved me from jumping into some trades that I shouldn't have jumped into, as I said earlier in this presentation. The other thing that I did as I wrote myself a check for several million dollars, and it's gonna, I'm going to cash that in several years, that's my goal to go toward that big, big goal, that big, nearly impossible to attain, but I'm, I don't keep telling myself that, but just to let you know, make it huge, okay? And I use that as a bookmark in this diary and every time I go to make a trade, or thinking about a trade, I should say, I look at that check and think, am I moving toward or away from that goal? And one thing you have to be really careful of is it, trading is deep on a psychological level, but you can't expect trading to fill a hole in your life that's missing. And that's L.R. Thomas. And uh, those of you who know me and have been reading, I've had a pretty rough 
last year, and I'm really looking forward to 2019. And I had to be really careful last year to not try to make something happen to make me feel good about making money in my trades. And as I've said over the last year when discussing a lot of these things, that whole changes over time. And it doesn't have to be a major thing. As I recently wrote, it could be something really simple. I'm building a house. First time I've ever built the house, okay? I heard horror stories, okay? Not that it's been that bad, but I've heard horror stories, but I've never experienced it myself. And I think it was even Schwager who wrote about that in the first Market Wizards going way back. And lately I found myself when I go over to the house and talk to my wife and she pulls the plans out. Oh, well, we got to move the garage back 15 feet because the historical society doesn't want the garage this close to the street. Or, hey, you know, uh, remember they didn't price those beams in? You and I were guessing $100 a beam. Well, it's $1,000 a beam. So now we got four beams, $4,000 expense out of the blue. And I'm thinking, all right, well, let me see if I can make $4,000. Well, read something like Reminiscence of a Stock Operator. And Jesse Livermore repeatedly says things like, don't expect the market to give you some sort of regular wage. And don't expect the market to pay for something in your life. So make sure you identify that hole in your life and don't expect trading to fill it. Also, very important here too, I, I don't know if I'm the first person to say this, but I certainly think it quite often, your trading life is going to spill over into your regular life, and your regular life is going to spill over into your trading. I've got a, a YouTube out there where I'm imitating Daryl Hammond, imitating Arnold Schwarzenegger, and talk about the problems with traders in like one minute. And I'm like, uh, you know, it does a kind of go the way with the Fibonacci and the trading when you're angry with your wife. You know, you have to be careful when you do those things. Now, the other thing that happened in St. Lucia, and I know I'm kind of last week at band camp with that, but it was only a couple of weeks ago I was there for Charlie Kirk's retreat. And one of the guys there, Casey, we were talking about trading journals and things like that. One of the things he said was create a confession journal. Just get a little notebook, okay? And when you do something that you shouldn't be, be doing, and you know what that is, if you've been trading for more than a day, then write it down in that confession journal. Now, this is slightly controversial, and a few of you guys, we've gone back and forth on this before. But my point is, if you're going to be a gunslinger anyway and take some unnecessary trades, or trades you know you shouldn't be taking, that day trade, if you are, you are a position trader, or any other thing along those lines, then I would suggest that you create or set aside, that is, a small account for those trades that are outside your normal methodology or outside your normal wheelhouse or action trades or whatever. And some of you guys argue, well, you can't get a little bit pregnant. And I hear you on that. But my point is, if you're going to take those trades anyway, do them in a separate account. Be super duper disciplined with let's say 90% of your trading account, but put 10% over in that little account. And if you want to mess around a little bit, then go, go ahead and knock yourself out. Now, Charles Kirk was talking about this and he took it one step further, which I thought was absolutely brilliant. You always get something good out of Charlie Kirk. He said, create a, not only have that separate account, but at the end of the year, do the accounting on that account and determine whether or not it was all worth your while. And I know I've fired off a few too many trades lately, and I'm feeling pretty good because I thought I was doing pretty good at it. And I think overall I did okay. But longer term, is that really going to be worth it for me? Okay, I'm kind of giving you a little confession here. Longer term, is it really going to be worth those those emotional round trips of coming in and taking those day trades off the indices and drip and LABD and whatever the other one is, LABU and those type of things? And I think my quick answer there is no. So I need to come back to my roots and just stick to what's going on. 
And I recognize that, hey, I'm taking some trades that I probably shouldn't be taking. And that's because I'm looking to try to make something happen. Maybe because I need $4,000 to pay for beans or another $25,000 to move the garage or whatever the case may be. But if you are going to do that anyway, then not only do it in a separate account, at the end of the year, take a look at your performance and see how you did and do some serious introspection and ask yourself, did you, was it really worth it? Okay. And it's going to take an emotional toll on you. All of this takes an emotional toll on you. You have to learn to live with it. As I often say, life and trading is making a decision and then living with them. The making a decision is very easy. The living with it is not. Number 18, I will believe in what I see and not in what I believe. It's hard to work hard because this business is hard work. It's hard to work hard in this business and not get the expected outcome. That often happens in trading. And again, you could actually be wrong, as I say again, because I say it quite often, in a pure trend following standpoint, from a pure trend following standpoint, you're gonna be wrong about 72% of the time, longer term. Now, I try to improve upon those numbers, try to get them a little closer to 50% at least, through the taking of partial profits. But even if you're not that accurate, if you catch enough winners, you're gonna do quite well longer term. But again, you're not always gonna get the outcome that you want, so you cannot try to justify what staying with a position that you should have exited or why it's going to come back or whatever. So very hard to believe in what you see and not in what you believe. You have to be objective. I used to say this all the time, but I said it so many times, people started attributing to me instead of Linda. Linda once said, if you don't know where a market's headed, ask a six-year-old kid. And Linda's right, because a kid doesn't try to factor in news or Fibonacci or the wave count or 15 oscillators. He just looks at the chart and he can tell you whether it's going up going down or sideways. So there might not be a good reason why a market is going lower, but it is. I think, as I said recently, we've been having a revolving door, people come and look at the house. And when they come in my office and see all these monitors and soundproofing and a video studio, they're like, what in the hell do you do? <laughs> and when I tell them, they, they want to know why the market is going down. I don't know. You know, we'll find out those reasons after the fact. But what is, is, and obviously it is going down. Now, number 19, I will print off this list, go to my website and print it off and refer to it often. The more often you refer to something, the more likely you are to do it. The example I gave, I think it was 2017, I lost 40 pounds and 2017 to some of 2018. But then I found quite a few of those pounds. And one of the reasons, of many, but one of the reasons, I'm not making excuses because I know what puts weight on me and I know what takes it off, okay? Yes, Dave, if you, if you move more and eat less, you know, that's pretty much all you have to do. That's gonna be in the next book I write, Dave's Ultimate Guide to Dieting. Page one, move more. Page two, eat less. <laughs> anyway, I kept those New Year's Eve's resolutions, easy for me to say, on my desk early in the year. And every day I'd look down and I'd see what my target weight was. And I know what my weight was at the beginning of the year. I knew where I was and I was somewhere in between for many, many months. Well, I began to slip for various reasons and I'm not making any excuses. But one of the reasons I think was because those New Year's Eve resolutions got buried on my desk. The more you refer to them, the more you're going to follow them, especially if you, obviously, anything you write down, you're twice as likely to do. And I think if you review it every day, you're 10 times more likely. So every day when I log into my member site and I see that my trading goals are to only take the best opportunities, and when there's nothing to do, do nothing. Once I do find an opportunity, I will carefully plan the trade and then follow that plan. I will resist the urge to micromanage day trade, 
or take any unplanned trades with the exception of a money line in the corner s and g over type of trade now i've covered those in a lot more details a lot more detail yesterday and that would be january 2nd 2019 in the q a but the point i was making there and kind of my confession throughout this presentation has been i've been taking a few of those less than mediocre s and g type of trades and not just the ones where it's money lying in the corner for instance today if we'd have been up like i said 50 60 points in the futures or whatever and then the market begins to come back in i think that's a hard trade not to take on the short side okay it's kind of that can't stand it test if you can't stand it if that fear of missing out is that huge and it really truly is then by all means take it now the one thing that i did pick up not the last week at band camp you but the one thing i did pick up in St. Lucia is it also, as I said prior to that, I thought everybody's goals would be process oriented because I beat the dead horse on process orientation, being process oriented. But some of the people actually had goals which were motivational in nature. For instance, somebody in the members area lives down in the islands in the West Indies and they want to see their children more. So they want to generate some capital through their trading to be able to see their children more. When I was in St. Lucia, again, last week at band camp, a couple of people there had accumulated money through various ways, and they wanted their trading to continue to grow that capital to create a legacy for their children. And one individual I was talking to, who's a bit of a system surfer, okay, or system hopper, have you look at that, trying to trade everything there, very smart person, but trying to just do too much instead of one simple thing. And of course I said, what's the Bruce Lee quote? I do not fear the man who has practiced 10,000 kicks once, but I fear the man who has practiced one kick 10,000 times. So just do that one thing, do it well, and then improve upon that. And once you feel like you've got that down, then maybe add on another type of system or methodology if if you feel so desired but become successful with one thing before moving on and what i was telling her i was like look you want to leave a legacy for your children that's great that's admirable but that next trade is much bigger than you it's much bigger than any feelings or emotions or ego you might have that next trade is bigger than you are you moving toward or away from that goal and as I said to her, it's like, are you taking away from your children's legacy by taking a trade outside of the methodology? And I think this is going to be fodder for quite a few presentations in the future. So on every trade, that next trade, the next trade you, you take is bigger than you. Did you really pick the best? Did you really leave the rest? Or are you following your plan? And all these other things that I beat the dead horse on constantly. All right, any comments, questions, thoughts? A couple of random thoughts on this real quick while I'm waiting for questions to come in. Some of these random thoughts were left over from a couple years back, but I thought they were worth keeping. Even when things are good, it's still tough because you're never going to get it exactly right, and you're still going to have losses. You're still going to have losses to open profits, which is nothing wrong with that. That's perfectly normal. It will happen. So remember, even when you're doing really well, it's still tough at times. Patience, I cannot reiterate that enough, is key. And again, be cognizant of your own emotions. I think that emotional journal, I plan on writing on it every day, okay? Writing in it every day, I think that's going to be a godsend for me, something I've preached in the past and something I've kind of drifted away from. I got too busy. Things are happening in my life and trading and blah, blah, blah. So I've brought that back and I'm serious about it. Or I'm going to be serious about it in 2019. And you guys can hold me accountable. And I'll maybe quote from it uh, going on. Like, uh, what did I write today? I slept like crap last night. <laughs> you know? So I know I'm a little tired, a little punch truck coming in today. So I've got to be cognizant of that. One of the things, again, this is like last week at Bandcamp, one of the things that came up was trade like someone is watching. When I make a trade, 
I kind of imagine that everyone is watching me. All of my clients are watching me make the trade. And all of the people who have learned from me are watching me make that trade. So I could turn around and say, yep, this stock was trending. It, it's accelerating higher. It's a persistent trend. And all these other things fit. This is why I'm going to take it. This is where I'm going to get in. This is 2% risk on my account. That's why I'm going to trade this number of shares and so on and so forth. When I told someone in St. Lucia was, even if nobody's around, I want you to, and I think I said this a few minutes ago, I want you to announce your trades. You might look like a madman to someone looking in, but so what? My wife, sometimes she's, she comes walking over to my office and she can see me just having this conversation with myself. She turns around and walks away. I can hear the heels like click, 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 click. <laughs> She used to think, oh, you must have been in a webinar or something, but now she knows I'm just in here talking. Now, you might, it might sound a little crazy, but talk it out. And when you're taking a trade that you shouldn't, you're going to say, geez, this sounds stupid. You know, yeah, I'm just kind of winging it here. The market's going up. I think I might buy it or I'm bearish. I think I might short it. As opposed to, well, look, we had this beautiful opening gap reversal. I'm getting in here. I'm going to stop out here. It's not that much risk, but I think the reward is going to be well worth it. Even though this is not a planned ahead of time trade, this is a trade that developed this morning. This is why I'm taking that trade. Now, on the trade you planned the night before, it should be a heck of a lot easier. Not, oh, I'm not going to get in, even though it triggered because the market's down. I'm going to wait to see if the market comes back. Oh, wait a minute, the market's coming back. The stock's not coming back. I'm not going to take it. Oh, market's down again. Oh, now it's triggering. Now it's going higher. Well, wait a minute, I'm going to wait to see if the market comes back. And you start that mental, and I don't know if it's proper to say, but you know what I'm talking about. It starts with an M, you know, and that little monkey mind starts going, and that's when you start to make yourself a little crazy. So, again, not the last week at Bandcamp, you announce and explain your trades even if no one is watching. Trade like someone is watching. Okay. Alimony expense. <laughs> Need to do top-down analysis. Well, you could you could do it any way you want, okay? Uh, I do more of a bottom-up analysis, Michael. And the reason I do that is because I like to get a feel for what's going on and kind of work my way through. Now, obviously, as I often tell people when they when they we get a debate off over top-down or bottom-up, it doesn't matter as long as you're looking at anything, when, what order you do it. But I already know what the indices have done because I saw them, okay? So it's not like I'm close my eyes all day and then look at the charts and then kind of go back and see what happened in the indices. Now, every now and then, if I'm super busy, I won't know exactly what happened. But for the most part, I do have a pretty good idea what the market did before I go into my analysis. I'm not going in completely blind. The point is that you get a feel for what's really going on, especially on those days. Like sometimes you have a flat day in the market. And then you'll just see stock after stock after stock getting getting torpedoed or hit hard or whatever. Then you're like, you know, guys, I think it was a lot worse today than it might appear. Now, some of you say, what if we did advanced decline and all these other indicators in the market? That's fine, but I think you could end up with analysis paralysis. I like to do the empirical research and just get a feel for what's actually going on. And I'll show you a little bit of that in just a second. All right, I'm not going to beat the dead horse on all these systems, but a while back, you guys know me, sometimes I like to come up with a really simple system to help justify and explain what's going on, justify trend following, explain trend following. And what I did was I created this little indicator that shows you how far away from the 250-day high you are, okay? And if it gets 10% or more and the market closes below the 50-day moving average, you should what? You should exit the market, okay? And then to get long, it would have to get back within 10% of, of the 250-day high and have a low above the 50-day moving average. That is the entire system. Now, we started following the system when? Oh, I don't know when I created it, last summer or something, when the market began to tank a little bit. And the trigger was, where is that trigger? Up around 2,800 or 2,750. And then obviously we're slightly below that now, okay? 
So what amazes me about something so simple is that it can help and help being a keyword in that sentence, but it can help keep you on the right side of the market. And knock on wood, every major bear market that has occurred throughout history has triggered a signal. Now, this is not some holy grail because as someone who didn't fully understand the system but begin to click with a little bit said, a non-trader person said, I get it. If a market is going to go down 50%, it's going to go down 10% first. And I'm like, exactly. So that's kind of the whole thing there. Ah, so webinar created some anxiety. I'm not sure what you're saying. Is a webinar creating anxiety? <laughs> well done, Dave. Thank you, VM. Are you welcome, Michael? I will get to this. I will get this down to five points, okay? Number 20, I will get this list down to five points. No, because it's 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 20 for 20. <laughs> you didn't sleep well, so you have some anxiety. Yeah, maybe so, you know? Maybe so. And I, I know I'm a little punch drunk today. Probably a little bit too much caffeine. All right, let's take a look at the charts. Uh, real quick, though, before we do that, a few weeks back, and this is an older presentation, and I redid the graphic and added a few things into it. When the market begins to tank, you're going to first see these small cap stocks begin to sink, and then it's kind of like rats leaving a ship. You will see a flight to safety towards big cap and towards defensive issues, and then kind of in the last gas, which is worth somewhat worthwhile, and these could kind of hang on for a while, and that's why I've been trading some IPOs. It hasn't been printing money, but I've caught a few that have worked. But the market will gravitate towards these super speculative stocks and IPOs, but eventually the ship does sink, okay? That's the whole point I'm making, that all stocks eventually will go down. The question is, is, is this recorded? Yes, it will be on YouTube, it'll take me a few days to get it edited. And uh, the members area, my goal there is to get them up a little sooner in the members area, but yeah, it will be posted. Speaking of the members area, I would recommend you join, obviously, for obvious reasons, but for not so obvious reasons, the Facebook group so far it definitely has been worth it for me. I've picked up a couple of profitable trades out of the group, and my ultimate longer-term goal, as I've said earlier, or I think I said, is develop a mastermind group. And again, it was fun being around these people in St. Lucia because we were doing some trades together and kind of jawjacking each other a little bit, and it made it kind of fun and holding each other accountable. And we had a profit target that was hit while we were in a session. And one of the guys said, hey, I just hit the profit target. I just got an alert. He held up his phone. It was kind of fun. It was almost like he was a shell in there. But it made me realize how great that would be when I got the ultimate goal to where we have this elite group of guys trading. But I think in order to get there, we have to go through the courses and make sure that everybody's on the same page and everybody is up to speed. But one of the great things that's turned out so far, and we only have a few members because you will have to join the Facebook group. It doesn't automatically put you in it. But even with just a few members here, the Facebook group has been a godsend so far. And I've been getting a lot of good feedback on the trading courses. And yeah, that's all free in the members area and completely unlimited. The only thing you have to do is you have to, as somebody pointed out, which I thought was pretty cool, I want to make sure everybody learns now. OK, I'm going from a one to one model, which has created a horrible carpal tunnel for me and has not been very effective to a one to many model. And I think that's going to really pay off nicely, especially as we graduate you guys up to the Facebook group. And the next level will be the mastermind. St. Lucia, my honeymoon spot. Did you make it to the restaurant in the Pitons? Frenchie. Uh, actually not. We didn't really, I didn't get out much. I worked my ass off. <laughs> I really did. Uh, my wife climbed, uh, I don't think they were the Pitons. She climbed the smaller mountains or there were two of them, but not the Pitons. Uh, they were closer to the resort. Uh, I like to reconnoiter. I like to get out when I go somewhere, experience the countryside, experience the country people, experience the country cuisine. But, but this trip, we were kind of stuck to the resort on that, which I'm a little bummed out about. 
But yeah, if I get back there, I plan to do a little bit more reconnoitering. Looks like in some places you might need a bit of a glide, the uh, a, a, a glide, a guide. We did get to the uh, volcanoes, but that was a guided tour, and we did get to the waterfall, but that was a guided tour too. And we got to see some things by boat, such as the Bat Cave, et cetera. So it was pretty cool. Climb near the spa area. Yeah, my wife did it twice. She did the two small mountains with the fort, and that's like uh, right next to one of the Sandals resorts, and that's what she did. But yeah, it was pretty cool. All right, we have digressed. So let's um, let's hop into the charts, and there's just a few things I want to show you really quickly. And let's let's go ahead and do this. Let's do do that. Just give me one second to get this set up. I'm using a I now do these shows on one monitor. I went from multiple monitors to one monitor. Pigeon Island? Okay, I'll find out. All right, so I'm going to take a look. Let's get this over to Telechart. Okay, so let's take a look at the piece first, and then I want to then I want to drill down to some individual areas. Okay, first thing. Let me get this cleaned up. Come on. Okay, we're locked up. It went so well in dress rehearsal. All right, let me um, let me reshare it. See what happens. All right, talk amongst yourself. Let me get this fixed. As you know, we've been going through a few issues here and there. All right, let me go back to the charts for a second. All right, sorry about that. All right, let's do this. And then let's do... All right, let's start from scratch. Okay. Sorry about that. Technology is a wonderful thing when it works. All right, here we go. I now edit these, so this will all get edited out. So my apologies. Thanks for being my guinea pig. All right, let's take a look at this. So I'm gonna just give you a quick feel for what I do. But before we do that, just to make it simple, let's let's just look at the market. Let's see what's going on. And then I'll show you how I do the analysis real quick. So obviously we gap lower this morning. And then now we're coming back off those lows. But this market remains in a downtrend. If you didn't know anything about markets, draw a line. Let's see if I get a linear regression line in here. Uh, I like to draw a line through as many bars as possible. But if you draw a linear regression line, you could see it's going to probably look a lot like the line going through the bars. Okay. And then so far we pull back a little bit. And it, to me, it looks like the next leg is going to be down. Keep in mind that markets will often fake you out. Okay. Oh, okay. Sorry. Thank you. All right. Everybody see IntelliChart now? It's waiting for it. Okay. There it is. Okay. So again, we sold off obviously this morning. We're bouncing off the lows from a micro level. So far, we're just pulling back. These two lines I've drawn here, one, I just drew a line through the bars and one is linear regression and they both look the same. Okay. So 
I think the trend is down. In fact, I know the trend is down. It's not rocket science. This does not look good. A minute ago, I said, okay, well, if the markets would go down 50%, it'll first go down 10%. So let's measure from this closing high and let's just see the lowest low we've been so far. So the lowest low that we've been so far, I don't know if you can see this or not, is 20%, okay, right at 20%, well, 1975. The media claims a bear market at 20%. Just forget about that, don't get too excited, okay? It's just a number, but yes, if markets go down 50%, it'll go down 10% first. If it's gonna go down 50%, it'll go down 20% or 10%, then 20%, then 30% and 40% and so on and so forth. That's just trend falling one-on-one. So we've dropped about 10% round numbers from the 10% signal. So I would consider that a profitable signal, at least it's profitable so far, okay? certainly would have gotten you out a lot of trouble. And the NASDAQ also triggered something similar then. You could see it banged out new lows, gap low this morning, coming off its lows now, but I wouldn't get too sucked into that type of move. We could have the mother of all opening gap reversals. I hope we do. We could have the mother of all retracements and this market could still be in trouble. Everybody's like, well, Dave, when would you get back in? Well, right now, I would actually like to see new highs like all-time highs in the markets for getting too excited. It doesn't mean that I won't see a setup and take it, especially if it's something I think can trade contra to the overall market or volatile enough and inefficient enough to make a move in spite of the overall market. But as a general statement before flipping the bullish switch again, I'd like to see brand new highs. Now, if we start getting the market bottoming out, we start seeing bow ties and other things happening, then I might begin to change my tune a little bit and be willing to get in a little earlier. As Justice Potter Stewart says, I'll know it when I see it, but I cannot fathom how these people are out there calling a low, I'm sorry, calling a bottom every time the market hits a new low. To me, that's just like trying to catch a falling knife. And I think that's a bad, bad, bad idea. I'm running kind of late, so let's just go through this real quick. So I'll actually look at all 230 sectors, 239 sectors. But lately, I've been focusing mostly on these major MIGs, which are Morningstar Industry Groups. And as you can see, drugs, that's kind of a defensive area. What's it doing? It's headed lower. Health services, that's a defensive area. What's it doing? Headed lower. So as I pointed out earlier, all stocks eventually sink with the ship. Now, some of them held on a little bit longer before imploding. But as you can see, they're all beginning to bang out new lows. That was hardware. Semiconductors have been abysmal, okay? For quite a long time, semiconductors sold off long before the market. And a lot of people do believe in watching the semis as sort of a, an, is a word, is it a, a harbinger? Is that a word? A harbinger of things to come. And I somewhat believe in that. I don't actually have a system based on that, but I do often talk about what's going on in the semiconductors. Is this being recorded? Yes, it's recorded as I said a minute ago, bellwether. Well, give me an example of something that's bellwether, like a stock, and it's probably headed lower. Okay, uh, let's open up for indie, any individual issues you guys want to talk about, and I'll be happy to plot them. AMD. Okay, is that a bellwether? That's just a stock in general. Okay, what do you want to do with that, Steve? Rick, I'm sorry. You want to you want to buy it? You want to sell it? If I had to draw a big blue arrow on the chart, I would say it's headed lower. It's not set up in particular. Even if it was set up, sell for now. Yeah, I hear you. Uh, even if it was kind of set up in here, you see how it kind of like ran up and then it ran down and then it ran up again? It's kind of, um, it was just kind of chopping around back and forth. But even if it was a beautiful setup, it has some support around 15 down here. So when I take a setup, I'd rather take it at a much higher level up here towards 30 to where it has further to fall. I'm not picking a top, but look for something like a first thrust down. Let's take a look at like a bow tie. That's kind of sloppy in the bow tie, but it had a first thrust down. Uh, let's just take a look at like the, like, let's take a look at like GoDaddy. We're short GoDaddy. 
GoDaddy made this thrust lower and kind of retraced in here. So I'm more excited about taking a setup that looks like that at a higher level than I am. That's like the original trade on there. I think that's when it was, as opposed to something that has already imploded. Mining stops going up on your radar? Not yet. Okay, let's take a look at, uh, let's see if I can find them. That's metals and mining overall. Now, I know gold itself has improved, but you can see so far it's just kind of going down. Now, it does have a little bit of a look like it's kind of running out of steam to the downside. But longer term, as you can see, let's look at, take a little weekly here. Longer term, it doesn't really look that great, okay, because it's, it's coming down from fairly high levels. So unless I saw the mother ball setups there, I would generally pass. Let's take a look at GLD. But gold's improving. My only problem with gold is if you back the chart out, because I know a lot of people looking for action. Now, I don't blame you. I'm looking for action too. But if you back the chart out, as you can see, it has a mountain of overhead supply to get through. That's gold, the commodity, at least the ETF commodity. So no, no real mining stocks on my radar just yet. Every now and then something will pop up. But so far, I'm not really seeing anything too exciting. LLY for long. Well, Lily was actually a short a few days ago as a recommendation. Not a recommendation, I'm sorry, just as a potential short. It To me, it looks like it's kind of making – I don't trade off head and shoulders, but now it's kind of looking like a head and shoulders top. And a good head and shoulders, or one I prefer, would be for this to be higher than this over here because it kind of fakes everybody out. But, yeah, on a relative strength basis, I hear you. It's doing better than the overall market. But I don't know if I mentioned net net earlier, but I often talk about that on a net net basis. Okay, what do we got? October, November, December, January. We got three months of slightly negative change on a net net basis. So as a trend follower, there's no trend to follow. And you probably think, well, why are we thinking about shortening? Well, it was kind of rolling over. It looked like it was in trouble, but now it's kind of bouncing around in here. So I would leave it alone for now. Okay. Hey Susan, good to hear you. Good, to, good to hear you. Good to see you. Where you been? Susan's a friend of the show. Boeing is a short. Um, it's a little wide and loose. It's a really, really thick stock, which is actually good on the short side. Um, I can't really argue too much against it because it looks like it's in trouble. I think there's some other big cap stocks out there though that are a little bit cleaner on the short side. Okay. Um, there's, there's a couple I want to mention, but they're on the Landry list for today. So I don't want to, out of courtesy of my clients, I don't want to talk about them. But look a little harder, and I think you might be able to find something a little bit cleaner on the short side. But yeah, I agree with you. It's probably in trouble. BSX, yeah, BSX, another one you mentioned, kind of looks a little bit like Boeing, kind of wide and loose and all over the place. So try to find something a little bit more cleaner on the short side. NF. NFLX long. No! <laughs> you just messing with me now. I know it. That's Mr. Home Depot. No! No! See, you people. Why do you beat the dead horse so much, Dave? Because why would you buy that stock? <laughs> Draw your big blue arrows. Holy moly. <laughs> See, nobody hears me. Nobody hears me. I know. Can you believe it? All right, any more? AU? AU for Don O, not Don. Uh, yeah, that's kind of interesting. With these mining stocks, let's take a look at a weekly real quick. I like a lot of these mining stocks. I like back in like 2015 where they're banging out these all-time lows and coming off those lows. Uh a case like AU, it is hitting those multi-year lows. So it's it, it, here's the thing. The reason I'm kind of stuttering a bit is with the mining stocks, you have to be a little bit more lenient because they tend to trade more in a more choppy fashion. Um, on a pullback, I'll give it a maybe. What's kind of bummed me out about these gold stocks is we didn't go down and hit those multi-year lows officially, and we didn't really have any clean – uh, up moves just yet. TXT. Well, TXT is forming a, let's see, forming a base long. No, no. How do I'm going to kick you out the show. How do I kick, how do I kick somebody out? 
Is there a way to do that? Let me kick him out. Hang on. Uh, let's see. I'm getting ready to end the show anyway, so I'm being silly. Let's see. How do I kick him out? All right, you're, you're barred for the next five minutes. Let's uh, let's dismiss him. All right, bye, Don. All right, anyway, let's talk about Don now that he's gone. <laughs> no, no. Nicholas Fine. He gets a Nicholas Fine Award this week. <laughs> he's trying to see if he's still here. No, I, I got rid of him. Okay, Lab D, I, I like these things, but only for a day, okay? These these super leverage things, okay, this is the bear 3X. Let me just show you something real quick. All these bear funds go to zero eventually, okay? So don't buy them because you think they're low, because what they'll do is they'll reverse split you to death, okay? If that doesn't make sense, just buy one and wait about a year and then shoot me an email and you'll get what I mean. But no, the reason I'm saying it like that, just not enough time today. Uh, maybe if you have a big gap down, not this is kind of a tiny gap in here, but a super duper uh, big gap down, yeah, it might be worth a shot. But just be really careful with those. And I don't really believe in holding those uh, longer term. <laughs> I can't believe I kicked somebody out. I'm kind of excited. That kind of felt good. <laughs> Now everybody's going to try to get kicked out, huh? Yeah, this looks pretty good. PBR, not bad. Um, I wish it was coming off of uh, – it's kind of all over the place, but I certainly hear you, and it's probably going to have some support along the way. But you could certainly do much worse. If you were just looking at who recommended this, uh, Phil, good job. Well, of course, Phil. Phil knows what he's doing. What, it's probably about a 50-day moving average. Phil likes that 50. Let's see. Lo and behold, $100 says it's by the 50. Oh, look at that. Yeah, Phil likes these retraces to the 50. Um, I like it shorter term, Phil, a lot. It has a bit of a witch hat look to it. It looks like it's stalling out. Longer term, I think it's all over the place. And then I think, I don't know, I just think it's too wide and loose to be shorting at this juncture. So, But it's it's not bad, I guess I should say. L-O-W. Yeah, this stock looks like it's in trouble. I'm not seeing any actual um, setup at this juncture. Let's take a look at it. Uh, you know, yeah, it's in trouble, but it's wide and loose, okay? And then it's wide and loose back here. And even if you did get short, it'd probably find support at 85 and 80. So I would leave that one alone. <laughs> Don came back in. <laughs> Ah, I guess I can't block you guys. That's all right. I'm, no, I'm not looking at that stock because I know it's a piece of crap. I'm not going to do it. Uh, this one's all over the place, too. Is it in trouble? Probably. I think most stocks are headed lower, so that's going to be my canned answer. But it's kind of wide and loose, so we need to try to find something that's a little cleaner in here. <laughs> Gold stocks suck. Avoid. Yeah, they're kind of all over the place. F is cheap. Eight-year lows. No. No. No, there's no such thing as cheap, okay? There's no such thing as cheap, okay? And even if it does begin to rally, you know, let's say it sets up in a few weeks, well, you're going to be capped at $9, and I want to get into something longer term, okay? All right, I know I ran long today, but we get time for one more. Going once, going twice. F was for Don. <laughs> okay. Well, Don's back, so let Don fend himself, fend for himself. All right. As usual, I want to thank everybody for coming. I appreciate you taking time out of your busy schedule. Uh, if any unanswered questions, shoot me an email, and I'll try to work it into the next show. If you're uh, on the member site, you can ask any questions you want, and I will work those into the next member show for sure. Or I could, I could promise you that will. So anyway, I think that pretty much sums it up. Everybody have a great week and we will talk again next thursday if not sooner yes it is it has been recorded and i will process it over the next few days yes